Hey you sexy beasts, this is Ariel DeVito from Be More Than Fit Personal Training, bringing you your weekly health and fitness lifestyle hack. Just because you've heard it before doesn't mean it's not worth repeating, and repetition is what we believe in. Exercise is the catalyst for improving other areas of your life, and I totally want you to accept that as a challenge. Test our theory in your own life. This week's lifestyle hack is brought to us by my friend Madaya. She's a nice little acronym for make a decision in advance. The number one key to success for improving your health and fitness is knowing what you'll do before the opportunity arises. This is the best solution for challenges such as going out to eat, knowing what your focus is going to be when you exercise, and what you'll do the next time an ice cream carton starts calling your name. It will serve you so well to take some time to identify your personal health and fitness challenges and create a Medaya for each one. You can use this list as a weekly focus plan, knocking out one challenge at a time. For more tips or to speak to a trainer, find us on our website at www.bemorethanfit.com or our Facebook page, Be More Than Fit Personal Training Studio. This is Ariel reminding you that you deserve the best quality of life available and it's yours for the taking. Until next week. everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Melissa Kelly Show. I'm here with Cornell Thomas. I'm super excited because, um, as you know, we've been really talking about all things mindset as we head into this new year. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Melissa Kelly Show, we started about four years ago, really just attempting to bring a little bit more of the good news in the world, right, to the people. Because you could turn on your television anytime and see all the doom and gloom in the world, but really it's what we focus on and what we connect to that matters most. So the more of us who can get out there and spread this positivity, obviously the people who are looking for it will find it. So if that's you, thank you so much for watching. Cornell, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I would love it if you would just give like, you know, a quick introduction to who is Cornell Thomas. Now, obviously, We've done this before, so uh, Cornell has been a guest on this show, and I will drop the link in the comments, but um, I would love for our viewers just to get a sense of who you are. Yeah. How about? Yeah, I love, I love that question, like who I am instead of what I do, because mm-hmm. what I do, like you said, it's very easy to just see a link and kind of see what I do, but who I am is I am the youngest son of Bobby and Tina Thomas. And if you know me at all, you realize that my story starts uh, with my mom, right? Everything starts with my mom. You know, she is the reason I am who I am today. Uh, She, her resilience and perseverance, you said something about mindset in the beginning. That's why my mind is, works the way it works. Because just to see my mom kind of get through very tough and adverse times has helped me do the same. So not, you know, I'm a husband and father and, you know, I speak and all this other stuff, but really uh, my mom helped shaped shape my mindset to what it is so when things happen in the world and we and you have these discussions often about you know some of the th- like adverse adverse things that happen in the world i never go from 10 being the greatest to one like i never drop down to one right i'm never like oh my gosh the world's the world's ending blah 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 blah, blah because i've built that mindset you know and a lot of people understand it's it's the ability to to train your mind to not, you're not going to be immune to situations. Situations are going to happen and it's going to, they're going to suck, right? Like something's going to happen, like this sucks, but it's not going to knock you out to the point where there's no recovery. Like I've never seen my mom get knocked out. And there's so many instances where we got hit with so many bills and so much adversity where she could have easily, easily took a knee and said, I, I'm done. Like I, I just can't take it. So uh, I think that's kind of who I am. I'm just someone with a, a different disposition on life. Uh, I th- I'm someone who's pretty calm in a storm because I've been in so many mm-hmm. and I'm someone that just wants to to help people every day I wake up. I just want to, my first thing is like, how do I serve? How do I serve my family? How do I serve other people around me? I love it. Let's talk a little bit really quick, just so people can have perspective about like the story that is your mom. Yeah. Right? Because I, it's so beautiful. I think, um, that level of resilience that you talk about, 
right? That, that mental resilience that comes from having gone through adversity and mm -hmm. walked through the storm. Now you know you can stand in it and be yeah. fine, right? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, so my father was a police officer in the city of Pacific, New Jersey. He passed when I was four. So when my father passed away, my mom had to raise five of us on her own with no money, you know, with one of my brothers being autistic. So it was just so much stuff that she had to deal with. Uh, and just really like, I never remember my mom preaching stuff to us per se, like saying like, okay, these are the bullet points of life. She did it with her actions, right? So me waking up and seeing my mom work three jobs, take care of the kids and have a smile on her face. Yeah. Even though I know, I knew, especially as I started getting older, I knew there are just times of struggle where I'm like, you know, we were the family from time to time with that would get the free turkey on Thanksgiving, right? We go to the church and get the box and the free turkey and the food so we can, so we can eat. And I remember one of those Thanksgivings that we did that where my, just seeing my mom's face, right? To have to like go and do that. Like I, she's a very proud woman and just, but she was like, it's my kid's survival over everything else. Like it doesn't matter what my feelings are. It doesn't matter what my ego is. It's my kid's survival. So I remember everything, Melissa. I remember going to the supermarket and us having to put like physically put things out of the cart, put them back in the supermarket and just looking at the smug look from the person at the register. And it used to piss me off so much. Cause I'm like, you don't know how hard this woman is working, right? Like you're, you're sitting here giving, looking, judging my mom. You have no idea what this woman is going through. And I remember just being like, even being like 10, 11 years old and being pissed at the person behind the register. Like if you only knew what this woman was doing, you wouldn't have that stupid look on your face, right? So, so uh, when I was growing up, like my first, my, the first thing besides, you know, life that kind of put me through discomfort was basketball. So I was playing very late. I started playing when I was 16 years old and I was, I was really bad at it. And that was the first thing like outside of regular life stuff that kind of put me, like made me uncomfortable. Like, hey, I'm not good at this. People are telling me I'm not good at this. And people are telling me I'm not good at this on a daily basis, right? And I have this goal in mind to be a professional basketball player. And I kept it to myself because I'm like, people are already talking all this noise about how bad I am. If I tell them I want to be a professional basketball player, they're going to laugh in my face, right? So there's, so I really did the basketball thing in solitude. You know, my mom just encouraged me with only like a few sentences, like <laughs> saying things to me like, you know, I know you can do it. And, you know, baby boy, I'll never forget. I always tell this story about my mom. <laughs> I was talking to my mom one day and she goes, baby boy. And this is like right after my senior year of high school. I'm getting recruited by anybody because nobody because I never really played in high school. And she goes, you got to treat that ball like a biscuit. And I'm looking at my mom and I'm like, I'm like, what? <laughs> She's like, you got to treat that ball like a biscuit. If you just imagine if that's your only food source, if that's the only way you can eat, she's like, what would you do for it? I will never, like, I'll never forget it. Like, I was just like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Like, I've got to put basketball ahead of everything. Like, I've got to literally, if I want this dream to happen, I've got to dive into basketball so deeply that nothing else really matters outside of my family. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. But, you know, flash forward seven years, eight years, when I got a contract to play professional, basketball and I get injured her teachings right the way she is mm -hmm. helped me get through that like because mm -hmm. you don't really get over it because I still remember being injured I remember the day I remember what I remembered exactly where I was I remember go, being wheeled into surgery I remember all that stuff you don't get over it right you don't get over trauma you get through trauma mm -hmm. so I was able to get through some very hard things in my life because the foundation was already set and it was set through adversity, which sounds like, that's when people are like, hey, if you can go back and change. At first, my first thought was always like, man, I, I would change how my mom struggled. But if I change that, then I'm changing who I am right now. So I, I can't, I wouldn't change anything. Like, even with my father not being here, I'd love to sit down and have a conversation with my father. But all of that made my mom who she was, which in turn made us as kids who we are. And then said, allow me to make my kids who they are, right? So it's like that butterfly effect. So... I'm just, I'm blessed for the storms that I have in my life. I'm blessed for the storms that I continue to go through because I know that they're coming. I know the, the next one is right around the corner, right? But I'm prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. You know, it, it's so interesting. One of the quotes that I have been in love with my entire life, the first time I heard it, um, I think I was, 
you know, early in undergraduate work, and it was um, John Dewey, you know, that children are always learning more than what we're teaching them at the time. Mm -hmm. you know, it makes me think about you watching your mom because that same lesson that you were getting from basketball, you know, you're not good at this, you're not good at this, and hearing that every day, your mother could have also succumbed to that in life because essentially that's what life was telling her, right? Like, you're going to have to work three jobs because you're not going to get paid what you're worth, you know? And, and all of those things, like, coming at someone would have just as easily been an excuse to give up, like you said, to throw your hands up. Um, but for you as a child and for the rest of your family to be able to, to watch her, to know her, to see her as she walked through this with that grace, right? Mm -hmm. um, totally leaves you with that same, that same lesson. Like, okay, I can hear all these voices outside of me, but that's not me, right? And I'm just gonna follow what's in here. Oh, I love that. I love that. Like, and I never had it framed to me that way before. That's that's a beautiful thing. Like, it's you're right. You're hundred percent right now that I that I look back at it in terms of my mom, the way life, you know, viewed her. Like, we were going through a similar battle, just very different, right? Like, I was worried about, and and for me, it was like kind of full circle where I'm like, I want to play professional basketball to take care of my mom, right? My mom's battle is like, I'm I got to take care of my kids. So it's like. It's so funny, my dad was the extrovert and my mom is the introvert, right? Like my mom is like the quiet, strong woman and my dad was like me, like my dad was like crazy, like talked to everybody, <laughs> everybody in town, knew him, right? Like, and it's just so funny that I have like, I just got both of their characteristics, right? Like I got, not really knowing my dad, you know, he did so much purposeful work for human beings and like getting kids off the street and all this other stuff without even me remembering any instance, not even one memory of me being there. And I'd be there, you know, he'd have me sitting on his lap or whatever with him sometimes, like not even remembering that, not even remembering him in his police uniform, right? Or what he sounded like. And like, I'm doing that type of work, but I'm doing that work equipped with my mom, my mom's mindset, right? So you know how it is when you're an entrepreneur, when you're, you know, speaking, et cetera you know, gigs don't just come to you, right? Like things don't just happen. I had this long conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday. And like, they're like, how did you get, like, how did you speak in the Middle East and Africa? And how did you, but I see, you have to understand, like this has been an eight year process, mm -hmm. right? And this has been eight years of planting seeds and connecting with people like you, Melissa. And just like, you know, just, this is, this is work. This ain't, this ain't some glamorous. You don't see me posting videos, pulling up in a Lamborghini and then mm -hmm. hopping out. Like, this is easy, right? Like, you don't see me just saying that nonsense because it is untrue. There's nothing easy about creating your own income without the help of anyone else, right? There's nothing easy about that. And it doesn't matter how much money you make. One thing can completely collapse everything that you're working for, right? So, I think, I think, I just thank God for that, that I've had the, these two dynamic and very different parents. Yeah, it's really powerful. And I remember the first time you shared your story, thinking about that too, thinking about the dynamic of your parents, the things that you, you received from them, that you learned from them and, and the reality of like, okay, here's this man who has been through so much, who's now, you know, on all different stages, being able to share your message with hundreds and thousands of people and, you know, being able to hop online at any given time. I love the value that you pour into the world, just, you know, going live on Facebook on a regular basis. And then of course, like, you know, the way that, um, I reconnected with your message was the other day. So um, there we were, you know, on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are watching who are not on there, I really love that platform because it gives you the opportunity to really just get with people who have the same values and have some real conversations. So I get this notification that says, you know, Cornell Thomas starts this room that say, your team sucks, Ubuntu, right? And I'm like, here I am over here, like, this is one of the most positive men that I know, but not positive in the way that you're going to, like, bypass all this stuff, right? Like, I love that you always talk about that. You can't just get over it. You have to get through it. Mm. But when I saw that title, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I had to jump in there. And I loved the premise of what you were sharing. So I would love if you could share that with the people who are watching today, because it was powerful. Thank you. Um, it, it's funny, Melissa, because when people, the definition of people that people have of positivity, right, is more times than not the rainbows and butterfly definition. 
Totally. Oh my gosh, I'm never angry. I'm never upset. Like, and you see these people that are like that are on social media, and they're just giving you the highlight reel, right? They're they're, they're showing you pictures of their food when they're in Cabo and all this other stuff. And it's like, man, do these people even sweat when they work out? Like, it's like it, it like <laughs> looks crazy, right? And I'm not. I'm always gonna keep it real with you. Like, I'm always gonna keep it 100 with you. That's what we. Say. Jerry's like I'm always gonna keep 100 with you like I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the good and the bad mm-hmm. and the bad about our society is how divided we are there's legit and real division and there always has been it's not 2020 that bought division it's not 2019 it's always been here right because the way the system is designed, it's designed to divide human beings. It's, des- divide, it's designed to divide people by color, by socioeconomics, by politics, by race, by now medicine, right? Like it's, it's, it's meant to divide. So what people do is we buy into it. Now, it, that's not saying that race doesn't matter because there are powerful people that did make it matter, right? Unfortunately, right? right? So it does matter because <clears throat> the system has made it matter, right? something we have to address but i can't say because melissa looks different than me then these are the assumptions about her that must be true mm-hmm. instead of me saying well maybe i need to get to know melissa mm-hmm. and i don't know what melissa's history is i don't know what her her path is melissa might have an african dad i don't know right like so we're just not having these conversations because of the division umbutu means i am because we are Right. So it essentially means people are people because of other people. Right. I am who I am because of other people. I'm a product of my mom and my dad, but I'm also who I am because of my family, because of the people that I come in contact with, mm-hmm. which means if we're all in the same village and say you were doing amazing, Melissa, say you were multimillionaire, everything's great. And we're in the same village, which means we're in the same family. And I have nothing. I'm poor. I'm, I'm you know, I'm doing terrible. That means the whole village is doing bad Mm -hmm. because you can't be who you are and have someone in your community struggling. That doesn't mean you come and say, here's a million dollars. Here's all of my money. You know, I'm going to get you better. It could be you coming to visit me and giving me knowledge on how to climb myself. It could be you just coming by and giving me a meal or saying, Hey, Cornell, you can stay with me for a little bit till you get on your feet. Mm -hmm. It's not a handout. And that's what people don't understand. It's like, for me personally, and I say as a, as a black man, because that's my color is brown. So people, that's how people, you know, distinguish, right? I never, ever, since the history of my existence, I've never wanted sympathy from, from anyone. Mm-hmm. Ever. You go through the history books and you read all the atrocities and etc. I've never wanted sympathy. I never want people to be like, oh, and put their hand on my shoulder. But I do want empathy and I want empathy to come in the terms of like in the form of, oh, well, I realize that things that have happened in the past have for sure affected the present. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a different way to view it. It's not like I can't pick myself up or I can't be great things. I know I'm great. I know other people are great. I know you're great. Like, I know that can happen, but it's not saying like it's recognizing that there there's something in play in a generation away from us. Right. Like my mom didn't have equal rights when she was 20. Mm -hmm. Right. Like people think it's like something that's like so far ago. Right. Right. So it's like this type of empathy, if we had empathy in terms of each other, our races, if we had empathy in terms of our religion, trying to understand. I remember 9-11 happened. My sister-in-law is Muslim. I have friends that are Muslim. I have great friends right now that are Muslim. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden now all Muslims are terrorists. And that was that was the narrative that was pushed throughout all of America and all of the world. All these Muslims who are the like, most peaceful people, right? They're all terrorists. Right. That's how easily it changed. Right. Instead of people having empathy and saying, wow, there are people on American soil that are attacking Muslims just because of what they saw on the news, right? They're bombing mosques just because what they saw on the news, right? So it's like, there's things that we've done and talk about. And if we cannot 
understand each other, if we don't live Ubuntu, if we don't live like, hey, I am because we are, like, let's sit down and talk. If we're so busy flying our flag, whatever that flag is, it could be a gender flag, whatever, we're so busy flying our flag, we can't sit and have these conversations. And the reason things are still the same and the system is still the system is because we are too divided to sit down and have intelligent conversations without people getting upset and offended and running away from the table. There's been plenty of times where I've had conversations with my family because no one gets you mad like your family, where I've got up from the table and I've just walked, I'm like, I'm gonna walk downstairs because it's I'm getting to a level where it's not cool, right? But in that walking away, and sometimes you have to extract yourself, especially when the other person is like yelling. But there's been times where it hasn't been yelling. It's been just a disagreement. I remember back when I was younger, I'd be like, man, I ain't even trying to, you know, we do the, I ain't even trying to talk to you. And we walk away, but it's like, then the problem still exists, <laughs> right? Like the problem still exists. If me and you have an issue on something, if you're upset with me and you go, Cornell, I'm not even trying to talk to you about it, then you still have that problem with me. And I don't know what the hell it is. Right. So I just want people to come without their shields up and yeah. just talk with one another. That's it. Just come without your shields. And if you say something that is offensive because you don't know, because your ignorance or my ignorance, like, I don't know everything there is to know about you. You don't know. If I say something or you say something, let's just hate, you know, Melissa, like that. This is why, you know, this is kind of bothers me a little bit because I feel blah, 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 blah. Oh, my bad, Cornell. Like, I had no idea. And this is what this bothers me for. And then look, we're having a conversation. Right. Right. So right. that's why, like, the Ubuntu, your team sucks. And you can see it on Clubhouse already. I was on Clubhouse uh, the other day and I saw a couple of rooms that just, they pissed me off. Like, if, is our biracial kids black? Mm -hmm. it, that idiot. One of their parents is black. What do you, like, what do you think? Do, they don't count? Like, they, and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it's like, these are the kind of like, these are the kind of divisive groups that we have. And it's like, and there's like 300 people in this room talking about if biracial kids, my kids are biracial. So what, I don't exist? I'm not, uh, so I'm black, so they're not black. Like, so it's like, this is the silly stuff right. that people do, right. right? So now we have groups. Now we're going to have black Twitter and black clubhouse and, you know, far right Twitter and far right clubhouse and far left clubhouse and far left Twitter. Like, that's the, the dumb stuff that we do. Right. right? Like we do this nonsense that just forms a division. I saw this group, Melissa, I swear to you, I saw this group and I said, I'm old enough now, I'm mature enough now to not even step into that conversation because the conversation's already starting in ignorance, right? right? It's, not, it's not like it's, we're talking and something came up and because when you're saying something as ignorant as that, I can't even entertain you, right? Because it's going to be like me talking to a brick wall. Yeah. You're already stuck in your ways. And if and I know there's a bunch of people probably debating back and forth. Well, this is what there's no time for that because I need to wait for that to settle down for us to have a conversation. Yeah. If I'm really mad at you, I'm yelling at you, Melissa, you know you can't have a conversation with me right now. That's why I said sometimes you do have to step away from the table. It's like Cornell's not even letting me, like he's just yelling. Like, I'm not gonna sit there and talk to him. What am I, what, what's gonna come what's gonna come out of my mouth that's gonna be productive? Yeah. So I, I just I just hope and pray, maybe not our kids' generations, Melissa, maybe we start to ripple and our kids continue and then their kids and their kids, maybe in a couple, two, three generations, maybe we're three generations away from it, right? But I hope that your son, my son and daughter, like, I hope that the ripple that we cause, the stuff that they see us do in this world because they're watching, right. it continues to perpetuate, 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 and then in a couple of generations, when, when me and you were all souls flying, floating in the sky, you know, just hanging out and chilling, right? The world starts to change a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I pray for that world, I do. Um, and I feel you so deeply. So number one, there's so much we could talk about from what you just said, and I know we don't have a ton of time, but, um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for, um, this this level of um, conversation in a place in a platform like that, where like why are we not asking ourselves the moment we walk through the door? You're going to start a room. You're going to start a conversation. What value am I providing here? Right? Because if it's not adding value to the world, what are we doing here? That the level of polarization that you're talking about is so powerful. And one of the things, a couple of things that stand out to me is like we 
a lot of people have this misguided belief that it all came out in 2020, right? 2020 just like shined the light on it, right? It was like we had dirty laundry laying around the whole time and it's like mom walked into the room, turned the lights on and was like, look, <laughs> like you got some stuff to clean up here. But then the other thing that really um, disturbs me is when people think we walked into 2021 and all of a sudden something's going to change, right? Because now is when the work begins. Now is when we need to be doing the things that you're doing, that you're having real conversations, having the difficult conversations, talking about the things that impact us. And I keep wondering, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of people that seem to have missed the class on Venn diagrams, right? I was talking about this the other day. It's like, I can simultaneously, even if I, let's say I didn't believe in wearing a mask, for example, right? Like that's a whole thing out there right now. But even if I didn't believe in it, the woman across the street who's elderly and terrified and has to go to the doctor's office three times a week because she's got to receive treatment, I would wear the mask for her to make her feel better, mm -hmm. right? To make her feel safe. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like this issue about, um, you know, whether or not this whole pandemic was something that was brought to us to like create this situation. I'm over here going like, I get it. The government is definitely, society is definitely utilizing this as a weapon for sure. But that doesn't mean I can't believe that there is actually a pandemic happening, mm. right? It's like all these overlapping things. Or for example, um, you know, the first time I started to really speak out about um, my, own, my own feelings on what was happening last year in terms of Black Lives Matter. And I watched a lot of my friends who are in law enforcement just kind of drop off, mm. right? Not realizing that I can simultaneously support Black Lives Matter, know that we have systems that are rooted in racism, and still love the people that I've always loved mm. who are out there on the streets taking care of our people, right? Mm. So it's holding space for all of it and being able to come to the table and have these conversations, being able to go onto Clubhouse and actually pour into people in a way that is adding value instead of creating more divisiveness or taking things away from them, taking away their power, taking away their intelligence, really, when we have conversations that are that ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but anyways, the thing that I wanted to make a point about is I feel like a lot of people will separate from these conversations, from the bigger issues that 2020 shined that light on, because there's this concept of like, like, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to begin. Right. A and it's easier to intellectualize yourself against the issue than to begin to look at it. Right. And go like, where's one thread that I could pull out of this, that I could be part of, that I could actually make a difference. And that's where you come in the other day. That is exactly when we were wrapping up the conversation. I love when we're wrapping up challenging conversations that also provide people with the opportunity to go do something. And it's what you just touched on a few minutes ago. It doesn't have to be that, you know, you go out and you're going to be some radical change agent in the world, but maybe your act of change is checking in on your neighbor. Right. Yep. It's, yep. you know, um, going down the street and making sure that, you know, that that elderly woman is actually getting food on her table and everything's OK in her house. Mm. Right. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because I feel like that's where people get it's like fear locks. It's like it becomes mm -hmm. a block. Like I'm afraid that I can't make a difference in this. So I'm just not going to do anything at all. Yeah, that's beautiful, Melissa. Um, that's beautiful. You're right. I mean, it, we're, it's almost like multitasking became such a big thing that people tried to push on you, but we can't multi-think, right? Like we can multitask, but we can't multi-think or multi-feel. <laughs> like we can't do anything like that. So for me, it's the reverse. Like how you have friends in law enforcement and you are speaking out, you know, being a lighter skin human than me, you are speaking out on BLM. For me, it's the reverse. Like, I'm a dark skinned human that has a dad in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I was saying that, yeah, great. This is, I'm great that people are talking about coming together. That's cool. But it's being politicized. Right. Right. So it's being watered down. 
Like same thing with the pandemic stuff, like all this stuff is being watered down through politics, right? Because this is a game for people, not for us, not for the 99%, but for that 1% that like is ruling the planet, like it's a game for them, right? They're, and we're pawns, we're not the chess pieces. When I tell people call to actions, I, I just try to be very realistic with the call to action because if the world hasn't changed in as long as it's been here, right? It, there's been some change, but if it's, there's still the same problems that we're dealing with in 2020 that we are dealing in, in, you know, 1920, right? There's still some issues there. Then how much change that it tells you that change is slow, right? Change takes some time, but I can affect your human experience very easily. I can say, Melissa, you look great today. Or Melissa, what a great, freaking conversation you're already starting to smile right like i'm already affecting how you feel okay so it's like i can affect how you feel with my words i can affect how you feel with my actions and really mean it and tell you like i love you like i think you're amazing like i can make people feel good you can make people feel good this conversation makes me feel good i'm being real with you most people that say hey see can you come up get up at like you know can we talk at 8 a.m i got it <laughs> I got to care about you to do that, right? Like, I really got to care about you. So, but with you, like, it was an immediate connection from the first time that we talked. And I'm like, if Melissa, and, and not just that, it's like when I was talking about doing positivity, someone up there, the first thing you said was like, how can I help, right? Like, look, how can I help? That made me feel amazing. I was like, even though we ended up <clears throat> not, we did end up doing it somewhere else. Like, you were like, how can I help? Like, immediately. That made me feel great. Like, I feel that I get goosebumps saying it now. So it's like, here's this woman that I just did one interview with. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm telling her, like, this is the movement. And because she believes in the movement, right. right? She was like, how can I help? That made me feel phenomenal. And that's why, like, I'll always know you. Like, we'll always know each other. I'll always have your back when you need me, right? So I think the little things that you might, people might perceive on the outside as little things are really big things, right? They're really big things. So we can do these little big things, like you said. Me personally, I'm not into the mask like at all. Like I don't think it does literally anything in terms of like our health, but it does do a lot towards people's sanity. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people, especially our elderly humans on this planet that are very fearful of right. what could happen. Right. And I love the way you framed it. If it's not for me, for this is Ubuntu, right? Not for me, for my fellow human, I will put this thing on, right? Doesn't matter what I believe, but to put them at ease, I will do that. It's like, if I know my kids don't like scary movies, I'm not gonna sit them in front of the TV and watch Candyman, right? Like, we're, we're just not gonna do that, right? So there's a lot of people that are very fearful of it. Do it for them. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about what you believe. Do it for them, right? And so I, I feel that 100%, and I think if, people start thinking that way a little bit more. Um, and uh, we're, we're literally wearing cloth on our face. Like, come on. Like, it's not like, you, if you really look at it, if you listen to like the people in the medicine world that they have not silenced, silence, they're like, come on guys. Like, you're wearing cloth on your face. Like, I'm on a plane. I can take it off to eat. <laughs> like, the corona takes a break. And then I put it back on. Right. And then it's like, it's ridiculous. But there are people sitting next to me in that plane that are very scared or have people that are, uh, that can that you know that have health issues where they're like i don't want to bring this back home you know that someone next to you in a plane could be going to their parents that could get sick very quick like they're kind of compromised immune system right so for them and for their parents and for their sanity i'll put my mask on and i'll just shut up and watch groundhog's day on the airplane until i get there and i'll be fine right it's not gonna like i can still breathe i will be okay yeah yeah. Yes, I love it. And I hope that we can carry on this conversation over on Clubhouse one of these days. You will. Because, um, I think as we like, you know, begin to pull some of these threads out, it's also helpful for people to listen and question, question their own behavior, question, or maybe they're the person who has the right words to go have the conversation with their uncle or their mom or their cousin. Um, and and the more the more conversations that we're having and we're able to hold space for different opinions and different ideas, um, the better off we are, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. So, um, before we hop off, Cornell, I would love it if you would leave our listeners today 
with some kind of wisdom to walk into 2021 if they haven't heard it already in today's interview? Yeah. Uh, I will say this to your listeners. One, Melissa said something that was very profound in the beginning. And I want you guys to understand something. From now until you leave this earth, life is going to be life. And what I mean by that is life is going to always happen. It's not going to change. And what life does is life brings you beauty and life brings you pain. Life brings you happiness and joy and life brings you sadness. That is the roller coaster called life. It's the price of admission to be a human being. So if you have kids, if you have a spouse that you love, think about the ability to love. I mean, when I think about it, I get emotional. Like, think of, like, we have the ability to love other people, other things, like puppies, kids, each other. Love is such, it's the most powerful emotion and feeling in the whole entire universe. And we were picked to live on this earth to experience that. And even if you experience for 10 years, 15 years, 20, whatever, right, you get to experience it. So that for me is worth the storm. It's worth the storm because it's more powerful than the storm. So just realize whatever you're going through, I don't know what you're going through right now. If there's someone in your life, if there's something in your life that you love, there are people on this planet that love you and care about you, right? You are ahead of the game. Yeah. You are so far ahead of the game. So take that with you every single day. Things are going to be hard for sure, right? But we, we are love. We have the ability to give it. We have the ability to receive it. I love that. So thank you. So for those of you who are watching and listening, that is something to think about right now. The ability for us to love, to be love in the world. So Cornell, I want to thank you so much for taking the time for today's conversation. I appreciate you. And a shout out to Ariel DeVito from Be More Than Fit, who also um, sponsored today's episode and kicked us off with a little bit on how to love ourselves. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon, Cornell. Right. And you know I'm going to have you back here again. <laughs> Anytime you need me. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you.